All right, everybody. Today, um, this is going to be a pre-recorded show, as I kind of mentioned a little bit there in the beginning. Um, but I want to make sure I get you guys a little bonus video. I'll be down in Orlando when this is released. Um, I'll probably be hanging out in SeaWorld <laughs> at the time of this release, so um, I'll try to drop into the comments here below um, as this is being premiered. But um, I invited my friend Red Hawk back on um, to kind of discuss Trump and the future of uh, the Trump presidency and what this kind of means for the people in like the libertarian or dissident right sphere. Um, I thought it was a really, really cool chat. He's just an awesome guy. Him and I hung out a couple months ago and uh, I, I can't recommend that stuff enough. We talked about it a little bit in the show, but I think you guys are going to enjoy this one. Uh, last time I had him on, it seemed like everybody really, really liked it. So hopefully you guys really, really like this show. So um, without further ado, here's my show with Red Hawk. All right, everybody, welcome back. This is another episode of In Liberty and Health pre-recorded. Typically, I do these live, but um, my guest was so kind tonight to uh, spare me a little bit of his time in his uh, very, very busy schedule. So um, I'm sure as you can see, if you're watching this episode right now, I have my dear friend Red Hawk back on. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. Uh, you know, it, it's fun. Uh, this time we're actually recording after we've uh, met each other in real life. So it's uh, a bit of a different experience. <laughs> yeah for real um i'm really really glad that we got to hang out too um you know um we uh met at a bar down um somewhat near where i live and we had a bunch of old fashions. it was a really really good time so um i guess one thing that we should definitely start the show off with is um if you can meet any of the people that you know online go do that every single opportunity you get because not only do you not know if you'll ever get that opportunity but i mean it's just there's nothing like finally getting able to meet um, the people that you you know talk so much with online. So um, I'm going to be doing that a decent bit throughout this summer, and uh, I know you've got to do that quite a bit over the uh, last couple months as well. Yeah, absolutely. If if you've done like even a halfway decent job of curating who you associate with right. online and who you follow and such, I mean, like when you meet them in real life, I mean, it, it literally is just that. You know, you just literally pick up right from where you left off. I mean, I've had nothing but good experiences with you know. Uh, friends I've met online and then turn those relationships into the real, you know, so I totally recommend people do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I've uh, definitely met some pathological personalities. <laughs> you could, you could kind of see it coming from like a mile away, but uh, you know, at the time, I think some of these people were in the libertarian party, which um, I'm kind of glad to no longer be associated with, but uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, <laughs> sinking ship. Yeah, yeah, you know exactly where I'm coming from with that. So, um, you know, why don't we talk about kind of your experience with traveling all over the country? Because, um, you know, I know you wrote a pretty large sub stack about it, but um, this is something that I think a lot of people, you know, should go out there and enjoy because we do have a beautiful country and, you know, you've been all over my state and all over all the other states. Pennsylvania is pretty wonderful, but, you know, for me, it's mostly like Pennsylvania and Florida that I kind of like the bounce between. But, um, yeah, why don't you uh, lay that out and the times that you've kind of had doing that? Yeah, yeah. So um, to make reference to the Substack you were just pointing out, you guys can find that on the Old Glory Club's uh, Substack, and that was uh, published on um, it was Monday the eighth. Um, so you guys can go back and uh, read that if you'd like. But basically, it was kind of a how-to guide of how to conduct yourself on a great American road trip. And I mean, I've logged you know at least one hundred fifty thousand miles behind the wheel at this point uh, driving across America. Um, I just finished a 10 day road trip that was just under 4,000 miles. I literally just got back last night and I'm getting back in the truck literally tomorrow to be gone for another week or so. I mean, you know, summer's like kind of like my travel time and such, you know, I know uh, to, much to uh, Jack Napier's chagrin, um, I've been absent <laughs> post zero for like two months. And so when he sees me on here, he's going to flip out. He's like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, I'll be, I'll be back in uh, August, but yeah, man, I, I love the open road, uh, America. We have such a, amazing um like diversity of biomes for you to visit there's mountains there's uh, marshlands there's open prairies there's forests there's giant mountains there's deserts 
Um, there's literally everything uh, here for you. And we have a great uh, interstate highway system, which I know uh, libertarians like a spurg out because who will build the roads? Well, it turns out the <laughs> government did and they did a pretty good fucking job of it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you. And of course, the national park system as well, which I've long uh, said um, in all of my content that of all the government agencies, the DNR, Department of Natural Resources, and the National Park Service are by far the best at their jobs. Um, pretty much every single like park ranger you ever meet is somebody who's actually passionate about the wilderness. They're really fun people to talk to. They're, mm. they're interesting people. Um, a lot of them will go through like seasons, like, oh, I'm going to work at this national park for three months and no, oh, I'm going to go work at another one and such. So you can always have really awesome conversations with these people. And you also just meet interesting, like adventurous go-getter kind of people when you actually go out to these, uh, national parks, particularly the ones that are a little bit more, uh, out there, you know, in the wilderness, not just like the, you know, like everyone goes to Yellowstone, right? But if you uh, are go off the beaten path a little bit more, you can find some really interesting folks. Yeah, man, that's awesome. I know every single time I go to a park around here, or you know, even when my wife and I travel, um, it's always really, really cool. And it's kind of a breath of fresh air because if you doom scroll on Twitter all day, you're probably going to think the world's ending. But uh, you know, I'm sure through your experience, you could probably go outside and see, oh no, life is actually pretty good. And like the people who are telling you that everything's over and there's a civil war tomorrow, they just probably haven't really been outside recently. Like it's just life is really, really good. And people generally just don't care that much as long as you don't really fuck with them. And I mean, like I said, you know, just touching grass. Right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, go and take advantage of it. I mean, particularly when you're young, you know, mm -hmm. like um, it, it's so odd to me that I've run into like Zoomers. They're like in their early 20s. They just don't even have a driver's license. I'm like, dude, like this isn't like Europe where we have like public transportation everywhere and everything is urbanized concrete jungles. Like, right. you know, it, it'll take you like six hours to drive across like certain States, uh, in America. Mm -hmm. Like you better be accustomed to being in the car and you better be accustomed to being in the car for a long period of time. And I find it kind of therapeutic as well, because it's time for you to like be alone with your thoughts and you could just be there to think on uh, certain things or listen to podcasts or audiobooks or whatever it is that you want to do. But I mean, I fucking hate flying. I, you know, whenever the opportunity presents myself, if I could drive somewhere, I'll drive. Oh, dude, you're absolutely insane. <laughs> you, this is where the debate starts right here, because listen, if, if the drive is over seven or eight hours, I am flying every single time. Not that I hate driving, but it's like, man, for me, it's kind of like a, a budget thing. Like, okay, so I could either use this much of my time to fly, or I could use this much of my time to be in the car driving. So, I mean, you know, I, I it is cool to kind of get to see everyone on your way there. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, like if I were to drive down to Florida, that's a whole day in the car. And it's like, you know, did a lot more with that day. But I, yeah, I, I guess I you're actually, probably too uh, far off. Yeah, I made, I made this point actually in my um, mm. sub stack even. Like okay, my, yeah. general, my general rule of thumb is, is like, okay, I need to spend equal amount of time like engaging in recreation as I am driving. So sure. uh, i.e. if I have to drive further to go to a place, I have to justify staying in that place longer. Mm. So if I'm driving two days, I better stay there for like five, you know, and then drive two days right. back, right? You know, so yeah. that's like a week uh, trip right there. But, mm -hmm. you know, so that that's just like a general rule of thumb. No, nah, you know what? Actually, I think that's a really, really good general rule of thumb because – um, yeah, like <laughs> I've known people that'll drive down to Florida and they'll only be there for like a couple days. I'm like, man, that is just absolute insanity. If you're going to like take five days off, you're going to spend two days, you know, maybe a day and a half driving and the day and a half back and you get like two days in between. Like that just yeah. seems like so much time lost. Whereas if you could fly, you know, it's two hours. Yeah. The airport kind of sucks, but at the same time, at least you're kind of saving yourself some travel time. And you'll get to enjoy it a little bit more, but you know, you know, much to your point, you know, you could go through what the hell is it uh the carolinas georgia and all that which has a lot to see mm -hmm. and a lot to do on the way down there as well so i mean it just really depends on what you want to do and how much you know free roaming you know capabilities you really have yeah absolutely yeah so i guess i should ask you then <laughs> what were your thoughts this past saturday and if you're listening to this uh two saturdays ago uh the they what the hell was it it was july a historic day 
Yeah. <laughs> July 13th. Okay, yeah, yeah. I want to make sure. I was thinking July 17th. I don't know why. But yeah, um, where were you at and what were you doing? And then what were your initial thoughts July 13th when you heard that Trump was shot? So amazingly, um, I'll, I will never, ever forget uh, where I was because sure. uh, people will know this if they follow my account. Um, I'm quite the naturalist. And when I'm driving around the country a bunch and I haven't been to like a major city before, I will often go to the zoo uh, in that major mm. city. Um, it's one of the things that I really like to do. And I was walking out of the Audubon Zoo in New Orleans. I was there all the way up until it closed. I was there for like four hours. And just as I get in my truck in the parking lot, um, my text, uh, my, like my phone rings. And it's the Old Glory Club uh, chat with the rest of my uh, partners and everything that run that. And my buddy Paul Fahrenheit puts in the chat, Trump has just been shot. And I'm like, oh, fuck, what is this? And I literally sat in that parking lot for two and a half hours just glued to my phone on Twitter at that point. I wasn't moving. I was like, okay, like we need to know what's going on. I got myself checked into a hotel shortly thereafter, and we did an emergency broadcast stream on the OGC like from my hotel room. I had to join on my phone because my laptop took a shit, but it, it, it's whatever. So Figured it I out. was just like, wow, all right, this changes literally everything. It's a huge uh, watershed moment, not just in this uh, election cycle, but – in you know like uh i mean american history i mean some of those uh photos are you know they go hard shall we say oh dude absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, me and a couple other people joked that even if it was joe biden standing up with an american flag with a bloody ear it's like all right dude credit words do it looks pretty mm -hmm. good but yeah trump uh really does have that ability to kind of not only be photogenic but he really knows how to capture the moment or at least like make the most of every single moment and like in that particular second he definitely did so um my wife and i were picking up some exercise equipment up at one of her co-workers parents house and i mean i i was probably a half hour away from the rally and i i couldn't tell you how many people i know that were there a lot a lot of people i personally know personally i'm friends with were there um and somebody that i'm now friends with on facebook i think i'm gonna reach out to him um i think he was a guy who spoke before trump actually rico elmore is the guy's name he's the chair of the butler county republican part or, i'm sorry not butler uh beaver county republican party hmm. um we're friends on facebook now and uh he was one of the people who helped clean up the situation with the person who unfortunately was shot um and he was hmm. sitting pretty close to the guy in fact uh, my one friend karen had put up a picture of uh, him and there's blood all over his shirt. I mean, I couldn't imagine being next to somebody Oof. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I guess um, onto the actual um, you know event itself here. I mean, and kind of why we wanted to do the stream in the first place yeah. was we kind of had a, a a chat going on in one of our group chats about you know what what does this mean? What is the assassination mm -hmm. attempt gonna hold for the future into the fall? What does it mean for supporting Trump? What does it mean for policies going forward and such like this? And I kind of just took the position immediately. It's like, okay, it's it's all hands on deck now. Like the, this mm -hmm. changes everything. It's like Trump train. Let's go. And uh, I I don't want to like uh, mischaracterize your position at no, all, not at all. like that. So, but you took like a little bit of a uh, an opposite position. Well, I wouldn't even call it opposite. You you had a disagreement. So why don't, why don't you voice that? So I I know where you're coming from. Yeah, of course. Um, so. <laughs> My position on Trump has always been I try to give him W's where it's necessary, but I also try to be a harsh critic because I think um, calling from within or within the house and criticizing from his own direction is an appropriate place to be. Um, and like the reason why I don't go after Democrats very much because I don't have to generally tell people who are of our persuasion about how bad Democrats are. But I think sometimes people tend to lose sight of how how bad our side can be not saying that they're you know the worst people in the world and trump isn't the worst person in the world obviously i mean i put out a tweet um yesterday talking about how you know if people were talking about how the left was celebrating about trump getting shot or you know lack thereof or you know saying that the shooter shouldn't have missed but i mean let's be honest here everybody on the right would probably have a collective laugh if joe biden got shot or if he was killed by COVID, and they would be absolutely right to do that. <laughs> I mean, I, mm. I, I I have zero issues with that. But um, basically, my position really hasn't changed that much. Where I think Trump, in my mind, at least, a bridge too far, and he he is too much of a leftist. He panders too much to the left, and he really doesn't seem to have learned anything from his first run in the office. And I mean, this is still up to change. You know, I haven't heard him speak or anything since. He, you know, the whole after the whole assassination attempt, but um, to me, it just doesn't seem like he's really learning anything. 
And I don't think he's going to deliver for us like a lot of people are expecting him to. Um, now, if you want to play the political game and you're saying, hey, he's lesser of two evils, um, he did deliver us some Ws, which he did in some small respects, then okay, I can respect that. But um, I think the people who are all on board with the PayPal Mafia and think that this is going to be you know, the second coming of Christ, essentially, and I know I'm kind of being a little hyperbolic, but... Um, I think you're getting led a little bit astray. And the one other thing I just want to caveat at the very end here is that um, with all the push for anti-BDS laws, um, I see people celebrating other people getting canceled and you're not going to catch me whining or complaining for these other people. But just know that a lot of these Republicans, including Trump, signed anti-BDS legislation into law. And that means your criticisms of Israel, my criticisms of Israel, we will be next on that chopping block, specifically because they were celebrating that Libs of TikTok account doing this. And I know you and I both would, you know, fervently disagree with the way that she goes about her, um, you know, perspective on Israel. But um, just that being said, I, it's tough to get behind someone like that and people say, oh, well, they don't hate us. Okay, but once again, we're next on the chopping block because we feel a certain way about this country in the Middle East. I understand being against the left. I completely agree with that, but man, it's hard to get on board with something like that when it's already in 38 states. And yeah, there may be, there may not have been a lot of like cases where it's been, you know, fully executed, but it's still worrisome enough to know that's in 38 states and Trump supports that. All right. Um, so I think from my position, I'll start with um, in at the very start in uh, 2016, um, I was not a Donald Trump supporter in the primaries. I supported Ted Cruz uh, in the primaries. Now that's come a has, long way. <laughs> yeah, that take that take has um, aged um, like milk um, uh, over the years. But once Trump uh, more or less uh, won the uh, primary, uh, I voted for him in 2016. I voted for him again in 2020. Um, I will be voting for him again a third time here in uh, 2024. And much of your um, statements about his first term uh, as president, uh, I would agree with. Um, I think that uh, a lot of Trump's uh, policies, stated policies on the campaign trail in 2016 uh, were huge letdowns. Um, we didn't get uh, Hillary Clinton in prison. We didn't get mass deportations. Um, I mean, we didn't get a huge restructuring of the deep state and um, NGOs and the influence that um, you know foreigners have on our politics. Um, he definitely was way too friendly with um, Israel for my liking. Um, however, I will give him a lot of credit for um, not getting us into any new wars, um, which I think – you know, I, I do generally do believe that Trump is like uh, an actually like an anti-war person uh, to his core. He just doesn't seem like a uh, warmongering kind of guy uh, to me. But uh, it, and the biggest issues, of course, were what actually happened in 2020 itself, which, you know, I'm not really going to argue of what how much percentage of it was under Trump's control. What wasn't, you know, because, sure. uh, you know, I mean, there was there's a whole media apparatus, the whole uh you know, the whole uh, virus and on, of unspecified origins. I don't know what the <laughs> hell we're still allowed to talk on YouTube or not, but obviously the whole response to the cold um, was not great right. um, uh, from Trump. And uh, it, it definitely soured a lot of people uh, to that for sure. Now, uh, of course, I've remained uh, skeptical of Trump throughout the uh, entire time he's been gone um, from the office for the last four years and then this whole uh, primary season as well. However, I still think he's way better than um, all the other Republicans even attempted to um, uh, primary him from the start. He was mm -hmm. clearly better than all of them as far as I was concerned. Um, and then um, what happens on um, uh, Saturday is the attempted assassination. Now, a lot of people um, in the audience might think, okay, well, why does this actually change things? What is what is the big deal uh, about this? Well, there's a couple things that are really big here. Um, number one is uh, understanding where politics actually is formed and what stories are actually made. Politics, when it comes down to it at the end of the day, especially in a democracy where the majority of people are voting, is it's based on myth. And I'm not using myth in the word like uh, King Arthur or something like that. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the collective zeitgeist and the consciousness is what shifts people to give a leader of whatever kind basically the mandate of heaven, essentially. And this is where you are allowed to actually do watershed moments where you're going to change things. And this has happened all throughout American history. You know, we can go by. Let's go back to somebody like some every someone that everyone will know immediately. President Obama. Obama gets elected. What's the myth around Obama? Well, racism has ended. The country has healed all of its injuries. Open change. And yes, exactly. We are going to radically change this country. We're going to fulfill on the original uh, promises of the founding fathers. Where all men are created equal, and America is done with its racist, horrible, evil past from uh, civil rights all the way through slavery to now because we elected the black man president. Now, of course. Um, when you actually look at Obama's policies, did he actually do any of that stuff? I mean, 
obviously not. I mean, race relations are probably like worse they've been in since my living memory uh, in America, obviously. Um, we got into a bunch of foreign wars. Um, the mm-hmm. economy went to complete shit. Um, there was, you know, uh, all sorts of uh, other nonsense with um, bailing out the banks and Wall Street and everything, which nobody ever wanted, uh, of course. So, the myth, but what the myth uh, gave Obama to do, or, or what uh, gave Obama was the cover to basically do whatever he wanted. And there was no, um, you know, uh, pushback from anyone, particularly on his own side. Uh, we can even look to somebody like George W. Bush. What is George W. Bush's myth? The, the George W. Bush myth of America basically starts at 9 11. And it's like, okay, we are now going to become the police force of the world, even though mm-hmm. we had been doing this for decades beforehand. It was now America has the divine right of heaven to go and police the world and hunt down everybody who did this horrible crime of 9 uh, 11 ignoring entirely the interests involved who actually were the people that uh, hijacked the planes did they have help ignore the conspiracies right the conspiracies didn't change anything the myth is what actually uh led to the changing the deep changing of the security state the uh, vast overhaul of america's homeland security department vast overhaul of tsa vast overhaul of the nsa of the cia of the fbi everything like this was overhauled under george w bush because the myth is in the air and now with this um assassination attempt of donald trump the myth is now in the air that Trump has the divine right to rule. And we are already seeing this in the last week where for the first time in decades, people are actually being canceled uh, from people on the right. All right. You're, you're getting teachers fired. You're getting lawyers fired. You're getting, I mean, people are working at Home Depot. We could talk more about this later as to, you know, the targets that should be for this kind of thing. But right. what you're basically seeing is um, what uh, Vladimir Lenin, uh, he made this statement a bunch, is about um, when you plunge the knife in and you find mush, you keep going. When you find steel, you withdraw. And right now, the right is finding mush. And this is the time to make as much hayway as we could possibly can and keep plunging the knife further and further and further uh, against our enemies while uh, we have all this momentum uh, behind us. And this is why, more than anything else, ignore the policy changes which I argue we're in a better chance to change in Trump's presidency this time than we were last time, but ignore all that stuff, ignore politics and ignore policies for a moment, ignore all this shit. Uh, The myth is the important part. All right. This is how people conceptualize things. This is how people go about their everyday lives. And at this point, it's just a foregone conclusion. He's going to win in the fall and he has the mandate of heaven. He has the right to rule. And now is the time to make hay while the sun shines is basically my argument. Ooh. All right, I need a second for that. <laughs> God damn. Okay, no, that's fascinating. And I, I honestly haven't really considered that. Um, yeah, it is really interesting. And it's kind of something that I noticed too, because um, I've been talking to people a lot about kind of this whole canceling thing. And, you know, I think I've spoke to you about this and I've spoke about this on the podcast plenty where, um, you know, I, I could add a pension, but I decided to be a retard on the internet, right? Where essentially I was canceled for my views, canceled, so to speak. But, um, you know, we're seeing now where it seems like the right has enough cultural relevance that they can do something like this, right? Where they could cancel people, so to speak, um, that if somebody on our side gets canceled, then there's enough kind of enough of a network here that like, they'll be okay. Right. You know, where you can go and kind of tell your story to other people who are like-minded and they'll kind of help you brace that fall. Um, and it's interesting because for the last, you know, 10, 15 years, the political right hasn't had a home like this. And Trump really kind of brought a cultural movement back into the right, so to speak, because, you know, Mitt Romney and John McCain were never going to bring that. Mm-hmm. Donald Trump was really able to invigorate the base and kind of capture this moment i can't really think of a better word for it but um kind of coalesce around the idea of populism if you will right right right-wing Mm -hmm. populism or however you want to put it and um get everybody kind of moving in a direction in a way that we really haven't seen and i think that uh you know i thought if he was coming back after you know losing in 2020 I thought it wasn't going to be as great as it was great being like as popular and as big, but it's interesting. And I don't think this is necessarily, um, not intended. Like, I think they actually intended to do this would be to, or to kind of raise Trump's profile to kind of get him in there. Um, now as to whether or not he's going to cuck to the deep state, kind of like he did last time, or if he's going to really go after them. I don't know, but there are signs saying that, okay, well, the PayPal mafia is going to be in there to have their finger on the scales. I don't know how effective that's going to be to me. I I think people are overstating that, 
But, you know, to your point, um, to the whole idea of the myth surrounding Trump and him having the, the divine right to rule, um, I think this is something that I really haven't considered, but also that we really haven't seen. And I, I think there's definitely something there that needs to be kind of dug into a little bit more. Yeah. Um, uh, Trump has an opportunity here to radically change the country in ways we haven't seen since somebody like FDR. Sure. Um, the, the myth is that strong. This guy has such a cult of personality behind him. And mm -hmm. people could say that that's weird that like, you know, people are sitting in the streets saying that like God himself uh, stopped the bullet, you know, like from Pulp Fiction, God came down from heaven, stopped this motherfucking bullet. <laughs> <Yeah>. you know, <laughs> Exactly. Like make of that what you will, but that's literally like democracy. You're going to have like uh, dumb people get to vote too. You know, and, that, <laughs> you know, it's just, it, but, and this also kind of goes into where like people were saying like, oh, the, the thing was staged and everything. It's too perfect. Like Trump is gone. You know, the first time he gets in, it's like a new hope. And then the empire strikes back in 2020. And now it's going to be return of the Jedi this time. And people think it's staged. It's like, no, it's not that it's staged. Is that this is how human beings conceptualize things? We conceptualize things in myths. Um, It's just how we have to uh, have processed our thing, our, um, our world around us ever since the beginning of time. And that is why, um, you know, it's just going to be so perfect uh, for guys like us. I mean, you could talk about like the PayPal mafia some more. I mean, JD Vance is clearly their guy. It's very right. weird being two steps removed from the future pre vice president in the United States because, <laughs> you know, he's literally mutuals with plenty of guys that I'm mutuals with on uh, Twitter mm -hmm. as well. I am stoked to tell you guys about the show's new sponsor. I am now working with MTS Nutrition, which is a brand that I've believed in for a very long time, and they run awesome cells and they have awesome products. So um, I want to tell you about their amazing protein powder, which you're going to ask me how many pounds I have of the protein powder, and the answer is all of them. So here I got red velvet cake, 25 grams of protein, and they have the amino acids and everything on there, 59 servings. Peanut butter fluff, uh, fluffernutter, 26 grams of protein, and then also the chocolate chip cookie, which literally has real pieces of chocolate chip cookie in there. So 27 grams of protein, 180. As I've talked about on the show, getting your protein in is very, very important. So make sure you hit that link below and purchase your protein powder through MTS Nutrition. Boom! And hearing the way the guy talks is um, certainly very interesting and could be uh, more sympathetic to people like me, but... We'll just have to see what happens. But the simple fact of the matter is, is that the stage is set far more in our favor than it ever was in 2016. Um, we have the energy of people on the ground, grunts, uh, for lack of a better word, that can actually get things done and just go into positions. If Trump was to fire a bunch of people, we have um, more support from people who are elites, people like the PayPal mafia, people like the Israel lobby. But, um, you know, we'll uh, uh, get into that later, of course. But uh, the stage is set now for things to be changed now will they who knows i mean we we might look back on this in four years and i'll have egg on our face and we're back right back to where we started but the opportunity is there and we should definitely uh take advantage of it yeah so i, I guess that kind of raises my questions is that you know when we look at trump's first term and the way that he's been talking about people because he says hey i'm gonna appoint nikki haley i'm gonna appoint you know mike pompeo people that genuinely didn't have his agenda's interest at heart um that to me just doesn't seem like he's really learned anything and you know maybe i'll throw a little feather in your cap now about jd vance um he's definitely the least worst of all people that he could have picked um and, and people probably would have expected me to go off the deep end about this because he's a china hawk and an iran hawk and like i i obviously completely disagree with him on those policies but of all the other people I hate yeah. say he really is the least of, terrible. Yeah, of all the politicians that Trump right. could have picked, Vance was by far the best option. Now, yeah. I mean, I wanted him to pick somebody like Eric Prince, but that was never, ever going to happen. So, right. I mean, of all the political characters, uh, Vance is by far the best option, and it's not even close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, what do you think about Trump, you know, being a little bit more malleable towards guys like us do you think that's a thing or you know or are you kind of skeptical I, I think that um i think trump definitely has the capacity to be swayed on um uh, certain opinions by people who are around him um now 
regardless of that, I think we all know how the actual state is ran in the United States. And we obviously have seen this since for the whole Biden administration. We know Biden's not in charge. We also knew that Trump wasn't entirely in charge either in his whole presidency because he basically was fought every step of the way. And back to what I'm talking about, the divine right to rule uh, and such. And uh, the likelihood of something like that happening is significantly reduced this time. I mean, people got to remember, Trump's been around for eight years at this point. It's almost like kind of like in a weird way, a return to normalcy, you know, because like he said, everyone has an opinion on him at this, uh, at this point. Mm-hmm. And at, it seems to me as the years go by, more and more people are just okay with him. Maybe not even like tacitly supporting him, but just by being okay means you're not an active enemy combatant in like the deep state organizing of things. You're going to have way less like 10th circuit court appeal judges who are going to autistically say and fight Trump every single step of the way. It's almost like the juice has kind of almost been squeezed uh, on that front uh, as more and more people are getting on the Trump train. Now, that also has drawbacks um, as more people get on your train because you have more people pulling you from each side and can kind of pull you off of message. Um, You know, from my own stamp, I really dislike, um, you know, the like this, like rap videos that you see of like Marjorie Taylor Greene hanging out with like rappers and stuff. Oh. And, you know, we've got like OnlyFans. Thank you. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay, like, what the fuck is this? I mean, come on. Uh, can we get back to talk about immigration? Can we get back to talk about mass deportations, please? Mm-hmm. You know, can we get back to fixing the economy and not getting into foreign wars and all this shit? But, you know, I mean, so it is what it is. But at the end of the day, it's going to be much easier for us to radically shift things now, almost like kind of because uh, he's been normalized. So Trump pretty much is becoming that uh, cesarean figure, whether he knows it or not. And maybe he'll surprise everybody in his speech at the RNC tonight. I mean, I really hope he doesn't do the gay thing where he says, Oh, we need to return to normalcy and everyone needs to come together. And I'm going to be the president for all Americans. Like I really just hope that the vengeful son comes and returns. He just takes revenge on all his political opponents when he gets into office. That would be fucking wonderful. Um, But we will see now to your point about if he can be um, molded, we'll have to see, but the point of just being able to have our guys be inserted into positions of power, I think it's just going to be enough. Uh, Just by having our dudes who are like have a line into the vice president, who have a line into other people, um, we'll see what happens with things like Project 2025. But just the fact that these things exist and they weren't around in 2016 just shows me that while maybe Trump himself hasn't learned things, the people around him certainly have. Um, And we'll see what that ends up looking like in the end here. And hopefully uh, it'll be good for us. But I think it's definitely worth uh, the effort at the very least. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable conclusion. Um, And I think you're kind of encapsulating what I've been saying a lot lately is that Trump really is the Republican establishment at this point. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that's that's not a bad thing, right? Because when you say establishment, people are like, oh, you mean like, you know, the cabal that's running the government? Not entirely, but like, okay, so let's talk about how pretty much nobody gets elected if they're anti-Trump anymore, right? I mean, all Republicans have to run as a pro-Trump candidate. Um, His daughter co-chairs the RNC, you know, tons of people in alt media and even some in mainstream media are pro-Trump. Like I said, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but does prevent or, you know, present different challenges compared to the old normie con, neocon establishment. But there are neocons, like you said, and other people that kind of are coming into this tent, which makes it more, you know, potentially, you know, easy to subvert in some sense. And um, I think that kind of gets us to the next point of when we're looking at the RNC and something that I think kind of... Doesn't look good is when you have somebody like <laughs> Amber Rose with a keynote speakership position. And this is where, you know, I hate to give a W to, but Matt Walsh, I, his take was 100% correct is that um, I don't think someone like that should be the face of the right wing movement, specifically when she said, hey, the satanic church, which like I'm indifferent to that, but the satanic church is good because. It's providing abortions to people and it's just misunderstood. And she said that as recently as like three months ago. And then all of a sudden now she's a keynote speaker at the RNC. Um, To me, that looks like the RNC and Trump are willing to be subverted by very, very nefarious actors who are just completely, and not to mention she was part of the slut walk too, um, to have someone like that subverting what our movement is. So number one, I question... Uh, how much Trump actually has um, control over the RNC historically. Sure. I mean, the presidential candidate has had zero of it. There, it's a it's a entirely separate organization. Um, sure. His um, 
what is it? Is it Lara Trump, like Eric's wife? Um, yeah. I might be mixing up which uh, daughter's in charge or daughter in law, whatever. Um, yeah, so she recently got approved to a higher point in the RNC. Um, I, I've seen her comments, and you know, I, I'd like to say, like, oh, maybe she just got in there and she, you know, uh, uh, hasn't had time to change things around. I've seen her comments, I'm not really impressed with it. Number one, no, this is why you don't put a woman in charge of these things, but it's a different story altogether. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's actually kind of a good thing to see um, the RNC be as gay and as brown as possible as like a clear, um, you know, like uh, almost almost like a yin to like, not a yin to the yanks and plies her together, but like a stark contrast to what uh, Trump actually is. Like, yeah, the RNC is uh, gay and brown because that's like literally who people are, co are courting uh, in the RNC. They're terrible. They're awful mm -hmm. people. Uh, these are like the Lindsey Grahams, the Mitt Romneys uh, of the world. Um, uh, of course, they're going to have uh, all these people show up there and everything like this, which is why I think it's also even more important now for while we have an opportunity for guys like us to get in to these positions and get rid of these people. Um, they need to be double tapped, you know, uh, so to speak. It's not just once for Trump to get in there. It's yeah. another thing for people to get into these positions and make sure these people don't come back. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, my take on the matter. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Lindsey Graham there, and this is another person that's been paraded around by Trump. And this is kind of why I think people, when people refer to neocons and how they're completely gone, I think a lot of people want to kind of shift focus away from Trump because they. I think a lot of people still tend to analyze who Trump is and how he is in terms of like 2016 as like the outsider, the anti-establishment guy who has, you know, he's just this loner on his own over here. But um, as I kind of laid out earlier, and I think you seem to agree, but you can obviously correct me if I'm incorrect here, but, um, you know, there's he's really representative of a lot of the Republican base and a lot of the Republican establishment now, you know, specifically when you have someone like Lindsey Graham backing him or, you know, like a, you know, bigger neocon back in the day, Frank Gaffney. And then a lot of the people, you know, who are like bigger China hawks and Iran hawks, and then obviously very, very pro Israel are all behind Trump as well, which I know you disagree on the Israel stuff, but like just I, I think people tend to underestimate how much neocon influence there still is within the Republican Party. And it's not necessarily about like the middle east stuff like i mean rudy giuliani still has a large position not you know republican party um being one of trump's bigger lawyers but like you know all that kind of stuff it's kind of moving towards more of like the you know ron china you know taiwan and then even to a lesser degree i mean trump completely cucked on his position in ukraine with the most recent uh ukraine aid bill yeah um i mean it's I will I'll push back a little bit on like uh, sure. Trump's control of like the uh, establishment because I I see mm -hmm. the establishment Republicans as still fighting tooth claw and nail every step of the way to ensure that Trump wasn't going to be around. All of them backed Nikki Haley. A bunch of them went back to Ron DeSantis. You know, mm -hmm. so I don't think that the actual establishment um, Republican Party uh, they're also fighting. Uh, you know, to the teeth to ensure Laura Trump didn't get charged of the RNC either. So I don't think the establishment wants Trump. I think they placate to their base by saying they like Trump because they have to in order to get elected. But um, the base uh, as a whole is entirely behind uh, Donald Trump, which yes. I think is also what is uh, so interesting about the assassination attempt that if um, he just didn't turn his head or if the bullet was just two inches further um, to the right, uh, none of us would even be having this conversation. It'd be total, total defeat. Uh, we'd be done. Mm -hmm. Our, our, um, our, all the energy would have been taken out of everybody's sails. There would have been nobody who even remotely had any of the interests of the Republican base come up to take up Trump's mantle. They would have appointed somebody like Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis and easily uh, Joe Biden would have, you know, limped his way or been carried, uh, uh you know, through the election, uh, again, uh, in the fall here for another four years. And I don't know, they, they basically, they could do whatever the hell they want at this point. Trump right. is our uh, vector, whether people have issues with the man himself, have issues with his policies, issues with the people that are around him. Uh, he's the, it's not the, that he's just the best game in town. He's literally the only game in town, sure. um, period. So yeah, you could talk about the influences with the neocon people. Uh, again, this is what I'm talking about, uh, getting in and uh, removing these people, uh, getting more uh, messages out, getting people on the ground to ensure that, you know, like our ideas are the ones that filter through. I mean, people talked about this a bunch, like when um, uh, Tucker was on Fox News about how like his talking points would just come out of Trump's mouth like the next day or something like that. I mean, you know, with, with J.D. Vance uh, being in the White House this time, what's to say that? Oh, instead of Tucker Carlson's points going through uh, J.D. Vance, it's somebody like Aaron McIntyre's. You know, like that's uh, mm. very, it opens up way more possibilities than any of us could have ever imagined uh, eight years ago.
Yeah, that's definitely interesting. Um, I, I guess the only pushback I would provide on that point would be uh, <laughs> you did have Nikki Haley come out and endorse Trump pretty quick. And, you know, I, I think probably the point there is that she realized that, like, that's the only way that she could still have a viable political career. But, I mean, we all know Trump is very, very, very susceptible to flattery. And, you know, once again, he already said Nikki Haley, Mike Pompeo, and all these people have a, have a space in the administration. So um, I guess I would pose to you the question then, what do you think the likelihood is that some of our guys get in there and that, um, you know, they'd be willing to work with people more along the lines of the dissident right, you know, such as it is right now? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, sure. That's going to be remain very much up in the air. Uh, I'll say this. the poss It's certainly not zero, um, mm -hmm. you know, which it absolutely was zero eight years ago. <laughs> so I can't, <laughs> right. I can't say um, what the probability is that, you know, I mean, do, do I think that like literally some of our guys are like going to be staffing in the White House? No, I think that's a little ludicrous. But I think it's entirely possible that the people who will be staffing in the White House are more sympathetic to us and mm -hmm. have the potential to forward our ideas. Um, and I mean, uh, I've spoken with congressional staffers who literally listen to like our streams and stuff like this, you know, like, so there are people there in Capitol Hill who are sympathetic to us, who understand what time it is, who understand our ideas and want to advance our interests. How many of them there are and if there's a potential for those uh, people to grow in number uh, remains to be seen. So, uh, I, I just think like, uh, I mean, what oh, what the hell else are we going to do uh, as well? Like just sit around and uh, complain all the time. Now, I, I will say this. Um, a lot of the pushback that everyone has been getting is, of course, like um, uh, talking about like, oh, well, what happens when Trump gets in office and he doesn't deport a single person, which is entirely possible? Or what happens if uh, Trump goes and declares a war on Iran for the sake of Israel and the tribe? Uh, also entirely possible. Uh, you know, like, nobody's got a crystal ball, right? But yeah. it's just that... Uh, of the options that we have presented to us, you just have to play the hand that you're dealt. And the way I'm seeing it is that all the arrows are just pointing in this direction, and this is the way we uh, have to go. And we can also walk and chew gum uh, at the same time. You know, like mm -hmm. we, we could say like, okay, we're, we're getting behind Trump. We're going to do some narrative control. We're going to make sure uh, everything is pointing in this direction to forward our interests and our ideas just like how any other uh, political constituency group uh, forwards their interests uh, as well. Um, you know, is like, is BLM constantly in charge of like the Democrat party? No, but uh, they do, ha they are a block and they do need to be listened to. And the Democrats do uh, placate them and they occasionally do get what they want. I mean, fucking BLM made off of like 1.5, like trillion dollars or some bullshit, you know, like throughout the mm -hmm. time of like the St. Floyd nonsense or whatever the fuck the number was. I mean, mm -hmm. imagine what people like us could do with even a fraction of that money. Yeah, it's absolutely insane. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think much to your point is that now the right kind of does have the opportunity to do things like that and kind of like the coalition. And the thing I've kind of noticed about Trump is that he really did teach, I think, right wingers the progressive lesson where you don't really criticize your guy. Now, that's not the game I want to play, mm. but I understand. And it, it's it's interesting because, you know, all the criticisms I've laid out, I know you understand and probably largely agree with, but um, you notice his base just kind of goes right along with it, and they're always willing to support him at any cost. And I, I don't know if there was always somebody like that for the right. Like, I don't think there was really, like you said, a cult of personality around Mitt Romney or John McCain for, you know, fuck's sake. Um, no. I, I think Trump really is that guy that really managed to kind of get people all in behind him, which really kind of always been the Democrats' strength is that, you know, it's it's not about who the person is. It's not about their policies. It's about, you know, just power and making sure that they win at all costs. And that really seems to be a lot of people on the right's perspective right now. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I think the other thing, too, um, for people to keep in mind is not just the uh, attempted assassination of Trump, but also uh, the other lives that were lost. I mean, uh, Corey uh, Campanella uh, might be. Uh, Corey Comporator. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm pretty yeah. sure I'm pretty sure I used to work with somebody who was related to him. I might be wrong, though, but, um, wow. you know, he, he had a, a picture of the Killdozers profile picture, which <laughs> is just absolutely awesome. But, you know, uh, heaven forbid. Um, you know, I think the saddest part of that day, um, you know, I'm indifferent to Trump, 
you know, it would have been a loss for people as a whole. And I think we'd live in a different country if he was shot. But I mean, I'd be more upset about the person who never got to go home from that rally because, you know, that to me, that's somebody that, you know, I very well could have came across at one point because, like I said, that's literally 45 minutes away from where I live. I mean, somebody lost their father, you know, the fire department lost one of their lead people. I mean, my wife is a volunteer firefighter. So, I mean, mm. it's absolutely heartbreaking to see something like that happen yeah you know it's not just that um you could have potentially come across this guy i mean in my context that could have easily been me it could have been my partners it could have been friends yeah. you know it could have been like how many trump rallies have i been to how many people listening to this stream have been trump rallies um we're playing for keeps now they literally killed like one of us literally it's like one of our guys um that that, that they blew their blew this guy's head off and now he doesn't get to be home with his family anymore right. and the people directly responsible for this are the democrats and journalists are directly responsible for this talk about real like, quick did you uh <laughs> i i don't know if you saw this but there were clips going around and i i just loved every second of it the people at the rally a couple minutes right after that happened turned to the reporters and said this is your fault i'm like you know mm -hmm. exactly right. rock and roll dude <laughs> yeah a lot of people in trump's face do have uh very good instincts um yes you know, even though they don't like have an intellectual foundation for much of their beliefs in the same right. way that maybe you or I do. Uh, mm -hmm. Quite frankly, it doesn't really matter. Again, like in the foundation of a myth, you do need to have, uh, you know, I don't want to say low IQ because I kind of like belittle these people, but you yeah. know, for, for just like, you need NPCs, you know, you, you mm -hmm. need NPCs on your side to forward your Believers. agenda. Yeah, exactly. And uh, these people have good instincts, but yeah, it's like, the 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 Democrats and the journos are directly responsible for this stuff, and they need to be held to account for this, and they need to be punished for it. Uh, simple as, you know. And uh, Trump is going to be a vector for us to use to directly punish you, these people. And I guess that can get into the conversation of uh, canceling people from the right, which is something that has been so unbelievably rare and hasn't gone into the minds of anybody. And you've been seeing this in the discourse um, on Twitter, like pretty much all this week, right? With yeah. people talking about like, oh, do we need to be the bigger person? Do we need to be the adults in the room? Do we need to have a return to normalcy and everything like this? And I'm just sitting here thinking, it's like, for fuck's sake, guys, like the right has its first like legitimate like media and tactical victory in decades at this point and you guys immediately just want to sit there with your thumb up your ass like i'm sorry but we didn't ask for this we were not put in this position of you're going to be canceled for not wanting to get jabbed you're going to be canceled for supporting a political person you're going to be canceled for saying that maybe we shouldn't all be like putting a knee down for a guy who was um, a drug user and pointing a gun at a um, pregnant woman and he died in police custody. So therefore we need to burn down all of our cities. Um, right. People lost their careers for this. People lost their livelihoods for this. People were killed for this. Trillions of dollars of damage was done um, in cities all across the country because of the lies that these people have been spewing. Mm. And quite frankly, they need to be punished. Uh, this is war. Um, for lack of a better word. Now, I will say this. Um, I think it's pretty tactically stupid that uh, people are wasting their time to go after Home Depot cashiers when they should be going after journos, teachers, lawyers, politicians, anybody like this. I mean, choose your targets a little bit more carefully. But, you know, simple fact of the matter is like, th this is just the world we're living in now. And, uh, you know, there's going to be casualties in war. And so we have to fight to win. Yeah. Well, I like that you made that point specifically because I completely agree with pretty much everything you just said there. Um, you know, it, it's <laughs> it's so insane to me that you'll hear the left say, oh, but Donald Trump has always called for violence. You motherfuckers were bailing people out for destroying private businesses. And then our government told the police to stand down. And then this year, on a, behalf of a foreign government, they shut down protests. I mean, we have every right and let's to also punish. Not, and let's also not forget, they literally made up false statistics on live TV to say that, oh, well, the George Floyd protests, it's not a super spreader event. It doesn't spread mm. the virus. We yes. were literally just told for six months we're not only allowed to go outside of our fucking homes. You know, we yeah. can't buy groceries and stuff without giving people this death virus. And, oh, no, if you go out and protest in the streets for racism, that's totally fine. It's like, yeah. fuck these people. These people are terrible. These people want you dead. Like, literally speaking, in this case, where they blew off a guy's head at a Trump rally, like, no, uh, these people, like, they threw out the, the high ground decades ago. Yeah, and we're still trying to cling to it with our fingernails, you know, at the very, very least. But, um, yeah, absolutely. I, I agree that we probably should be going after people a little bit more tactfully. But, I mean, at the same time, I'm not going to sit here and cry over their loss. I mean, once again, you guys wanted to bring it to this point? Okay, 
Oh, don't be surprised when that sword comes back at you. Now, once again, I'm not going to be out here pushing for it, but you know, once again, when I see leftists getting fired or their life going to shit, hey, once again, you wanted to turn up the heat, then when we finally get cultural relevance and it comes back on you, I mean, you you decide to play that deck, so now we're playing for keeps as well. So, um, you know, I, it is funny to kind of see Destiny just completely get absolutely shat on because i mean he's been out here shilling for biden and then for all the worst policies specifically israel too which is absolutely insane you know you would think that the democrats would be a little bit you know keen on that at least like culturally but i mean he's basically just you know a a, a, pat, a younger more what's the word i'm looking for cognizant voice for joe biden so you know of course he's not going to dissent on that well uh and again he still hasn't stopped since uh this weekend he's calling for more and more violence against um uh, trump supporters against conservatives wishing for everyone to be dead and i think um we're working on a campaign for this right now um i want to get desantis on this guy's radar and i want him tried i want i want uh, lawyers to find him i want to i want him arrested i want him thrown in jail um, you know, this guy is literally preaching for uh, political violence. Uh, get him. Go after him. Um, th th this guy doesn't deserve any sympathy uh, from any of us, period. And I want to live in a world where Destiny is terrified to speak his mind. That That's the world I want to live in. Um, and uh, if, if we can get uh, people actively moving in that direction to make sure these people fear us, uh, fantastic. That's, that's, that's a step in the right direction. It's, again, like I was say, saying uh, earlier, it's like we're playing for keeps at this point. Um, it is time to, you know, uh, like I was talking about for uh, when, uh, stabbing with the knife. We're finding mush right now. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Uh, this is what the left does all the time. They've been successful for it for over 100 years at this point. It, it's about time that we actually start uh, stacking wins. Uh, keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah, so I, I guess I want to ask you then about do you think that – this is the question that's on every single libertarian's mind, including myself, even though I'm, I'm, I, I used to consider myself an anarchist, but, um, you know, I'll come out on air and say, is I no longer hold that position. Um, I, I definitely yeah, have changed I, my I, mind I on once that. thought that too. You know, I'm a recovering libertarian. I am uh, said many times. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll call myself a minarchist, a, a very, very limited government minarchist. And that's kind of where I'm staying right now. Um, and you know, maybe that opinion will change over time, but, um, are you potentially concerned of the excesses that this may cause in the long term? Like, you know, we may see, <laughs> you know, going after heavy metal and stuff like this stuff that means a lot to me, which, um, you know, I understand that, you know, we're playing for keeps here and there are going to be some casualties. Um, I, I just, I don't know. I don't know where this starts and stops. Um, are you concerned of any excesses and what are your thoughts around in that? I mean, um, if, uh, do I think that like you're gonna have like a huge resurgence of like uh, the Christian nationalist or religious right uh, scare of like you know people are afraid of like uh, Dungeons and Dragons and such uh, like you did in the 80s? Um, no, I, I don't really think that's on the horizon. I think that uh, you know it just seems like that faction has lost a lot of relevancy since that time period. Sure. But also, I, I've been thinking about this more recently. I mean. When you see, like, the current degenerate, um, like, dysgenic fucks and horrible filth that are currently at, like, anime conventions and D&D &D, uh, conventions and such like this, I mean, like, maybe there actually was something to it, uh, these people um, who were, <laughs> you know, uh, saying that this stuff is, like, uh, pretty bad and we probably shouldn't be normalizing this kind of stuff. I understand that, I mean, I play Dungeons & Dragons, too. I play it. I'm in a group every Monday uh, with friends of mine. Yeah. We've been in the same group for five years. You know, like, I, I understand. Like, I like D&D, &D too. But I think there is something to be said for, um, I, I guess what my point is, is a broader attack on egalitarianism as a whole. It's like, okay, maybe for some people, uh, heavy metal and, you know, um, uh, D&D &D and anime and stuff is good. But maybe for a lot of people, it probably should be banned. And people probably shouldn't have access to this kind of stuff. Because it clearly, in enough cases, it turns people into some extremely weird fucking people. I mean, like, you look at, like, an anime convention, like, what the fuck? Like, uh, how, how are you even alive? You know, like, something, something is really, really wrong here, you know? And uh, so, I mean, I'm just a radical anti-egalitarian on pretty much all of these things. So it's okay when we do it. It's bad when they do it. And I think that's a totally reasonable standard to uh, hold in almost all circumstances. Same thing with, like, pretty much all the other uh, rights that we talk about. It's like, oh, um, uh, okay, so you're against um, uh, uh, free speech for people to talk about their political opponents? Yes, I am. I don't, I don't think lots of should be allowed to have free speech, period. Uh, and, well, okay, whoop-de-doo. What about the Second Amendment? Cool, my guys can own guns, they can't. 
simple as that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I don't know if I'm quite there yet. Maybe one day I'll change my mind. But um, no, I'm definitely with you on when you go to some of these events, um, specifically if you go to a libertarian event, you'll definitely see people That's who are like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'll definitely see people where you're kind of like, I want nothing to do with you. And like, I can't believe that I'm sharing a room with you right now. I mean, you know, <laughs> I would like to believe I live a pretty damn good life. I take a damn good care of myself and I'm a presentable person in public. I speak well, but then like you see some of these other people when you're out in public and you're like, my God, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> yeah. Well, this kind of just gets to um, kind of like the point on, and one of my biggest disagreements with uh, libertarianism as a whole at this point, it's like, okay, so everyone's got that, like, 51 year old uh divorced wine mom aunt who like divorced her husband and has two kids and likes rachel maddow like that that woman right there is incapable of self-government no period and that that person needs to be ruled over and th there are a vast majority of the population in the united states that are just like this whether they're on the yeah. right or whether they're on the left uh and so my biggest gripes with uh libertarians is kind of like the, the three like prongs of liberty, so, so to speak, is like, number one, everyone deserves to be free. Everyone um, wants to be free and everyone should be free. And it's like, well, through COVID, we just have seen blatantly, obviously, that not everybody wants to be free. Um, can everybody be free? Well, just simple fact of like uh, IQ differences, simple fact of like everyone's personal abilities and such, not everybody can be free. And then the very last uh, domino to fall there, which I think is the biggest one for uh, a lot of libertarians to get over, is like, well, should everyone be free? It's like, uh, I don't think there's any like uh, good things have come out of the world for the fact that like communists are allowed to talk. Like, I, I don't think that that's, that's <laughs> I don't think that's brought any more joy into the world. I don't think that's you know made uh, everything a better place to be. I don't think like the prospects of like AI to the point of where we need to have like a Butlerian jihad is good for the world. Uh, I don't really think uh, giving everyone access to the internet so they can get pornography at age like 15 is a good thing for the world. No, uh, there probably really should be some severe restrictions on a lot of things that we have just normalized for the vast majority of people. And unfortunately, um, you know, for libertarians, um, you either need to have one of two things with that. You either need to have a strong government to reduce these things, or you need to have strong social institutions for these things. And libertarians just kind of want to eliminate both of those and think that things are just going to work themselves out uh, because everyone can live in their own communities and some people can go live over here and they're going to have these own uh, views on things. And it's like, no, I mean, it, like you need a strong church, you need a strong uh, family structure, you need strong communities, you need strong you know, uh, a racial and ethnic identity to uh, keep all these horrible excesses of human nature in check. And you can't just like tear down all these like walls, like in a Chesterton's fence uh, kind of conception. Like you can't just tear down all of these things because, you know, oh, it's, uh, it's oppressive and against personal freedom. It's like, well, I mean, is it against personal freedom that like, I have to take care of my kids? I mean, yeah, that puts that, that like limits the freedom. Like I can't go out on uh, to a nightclub and drink every single night. Yeah, that's limiting my freedom in some way. But, you know, everything in life is trade-offs. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think that's kind of what moved me away from being an, anar an anarchist. But, like, originally, all this stuff kind of... The responsibility factor of freedom, like the fact that you're going to have to basically do more things and you're going to have to be more responsible for your actions always seemed kind of intuitive to me. But then, you know, the more and more I interact with libertarians, it doesn't quite seem to be so intuitive to other people. Like I remember seeing one person who like him and I are friends, but I, I couldn't believe that he fucking said this. He said, oh, the libertarian party was better when it was a swingers club. And like, regardless of what you think about the libertarian party, <laughs> if you have somebody saying that I want nothing to do with your organization, if you think it's should be a swingers club because that's that promotes nothing good uh, i mean that literally is the definition of just straight up hedonism which like hey you know you can like to have sex with your wife or you know with your girlfriend whatever but when you officially have an institution that is just there that you explicitly say is there to promote degeneracy i, I gotta ask some questions and i gotta say yeah. That's not my deal, and I wouldn't want my kids, I wouldn't want my family anywhere around that. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. so that's totally, totally agree. You know, which is uh, it, it just brings into like a whole bunch of other questions as to okay, so what is going to be like your form of society or form of uh, government at this point? And mm -hmm. 
you know, I will throw um uh, one bone to um well, I guess two bones to uh, libertarians. I mean, I think they pretty much entirely get it right on at least how economics uh, functions in reality through uh, Austrian econ. Um, whether that means we should be adopting that is a different subject. But uh, the the <laughs> Ah, uh, fuck! I forgot what I was going to say with my uh, my other point um, with libertarians. Oh, uh, Hans Hermann Oppa. He got pretty much everything oh, yeah. right. Yeah, I'll throw a bone to him. Yeah, <laughs> he, he pretty much is correct on almost everything. So, um, as it relates to the rest of libertarian thinkers, uh, there's questions in the air. But if you're going to read somebody, go read like Democracy: The God That Failed or something. Mm -hmm. No, uh, Hoppe is pretty good in this regard. Yeah, but I mean, he even seemed to have gotten that, like, at least for me, what was always intuitive, uh, the kind of tight, cohesive social order aspect correct, which um, I don't know how people look at, you know, any kind of prosperous society and think that you could have a prosperous society without that. And um, I, I think you're agnostic as well, but, um, you know... <laughs> I, I can't help but look at religion as a very, very useful thing. So, you know, a lot of leftists and people who don't like religion will bash it all day. But, I mean, it's very, very hard to deny the effects that it has on people and how well it benefits their lives. And that's why I would never tear it down. And that's why I'm always open to having conversations about religion and um, kind of about the utility of it in that respect. Yeah, I'm not a uh, religion uh, counter signaler um, by oh, no, any no, means. No. You know, um, I mean, uh, I guess I'd like call myself like, you know, I mean, uh, agnostic, but also like culturally Christian. I know that all sounds like really gay uh, and shit like that. But <laughs> no, I understand because I feel the same yeah. way. <laughs> yeah, but it's just like, uh, I mean, uh, maybe and maybe that'll change uh, uh, in the future. I mean, right. I imagine I'll have a very radically different uh, view of the world uh, when I have kids. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, should that ever happen, uh, I should say. But you know, uh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But yeah, I mean, there there needs to be some kind of uh, restrictions on the, um, you know, the totality of uh, the human experience, you know, and whether that comes from strong communities or church or, you know, uh, hard times or uh, whatever that may be, or, or strong government, you know, which is kind of gets into uh, a certain uh, form of government that was uh, popularized in the mid-century by um, uh, certain um, uh, factions uh, in the Second World War, but, you know, <laughs> that, that, that gets into uh, different topics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's kind of... I wish I was a little bit more knowledgeable about that stuff. And uh, Pete, our mutual friend Pete, had uh, linked me to his video series on the Spanish Inquisition because um, I'm just, frankly, very, very ignorant of it. Oh, those are great. And, yeah, yeah, you never really hear about it, but um, <laughs> when uh, I don't know if you know Brandon Harnish, but he's a uh, city councilman out of Indiana. Uh, you would really, really like him. He had a tweet that went a little bit viral, and he said, "There's no candidate that's too right wing for me." Uh, cleanse the churches. Yeah. Oh, dude, if if I could find the tweet, I'll send it over to you. But um, he said, "Bring back the Spanish Inquisition." At the very end, he's like, "I couldn't tell you my limit," <laughs> and surely enough. The leftists had a meltdown right underneath of it. And, you know, like I said, I'm pretty ignorant of a lot of that stuff. But after I saw that, I'm like, you know, Brandon's my guy, so he has to be on to something. <laughs> All right, guys, we are going to take a quick break from the show to tell you about the show's sponsor. We are now brought to you by Fox and Sons Coffee. As you can see right here, I got the Den Blend Dark. Really enjoy that. Um, I've been drinking a lot of their Brazil honey prep. Right here, as you can hear, there's not a lot of beans left in it because I've been drinking it quite a bit. Um, just to tell you a little bit about Fox and Sons, why I support them and why you should too, is that uh, Stephen had started the company up in Michigan to help teach his son about entrepreneurship. Um, I'm all about that. And I do firmly believe that in order to spread liberty in our lifetimes, we have to support those who support similar values as us. And Stephen does support all the same libertarian values that I bring and talk about on the show a lot. So go to foxandsons.com, use code Kyle at checkout to get 15% off of orders, $25 or more. And there's always free shipping whenever you place an order that is more than $37.99. Um, find their coffee absolutely fantastic, and I'm sure you will too. So uh, one more time, go to foxandsons.com, use code Kyle at checkout to get yourself a little discount, let them know I sent you, and support the coffee that supports you. All right, guys, thanks. Back to the show. 
Yeah, yeah. The um, this is a a very popular term that um has mm. gotten a lot more traction on the um distant right circles in the last year. It's called mm. netter, no enemies to the right, and mm. you see this all the time with um uh, left wing factions. They never ever ever uh publicly counter signal their um their radicals. Um, mm. now they'll keep them in check. You know, like uh Nancy Pelosi will give like AOC and the squad like the death stare at the State of the Union address or something, and they'll get <laughs> yeah. in line. But she'll never go out of her way to you know, uh, counter signal, uh, them by any means. And the right just does this all the fucking time. Um, you know, they're the, the very first people who will go about out of their ways to cancel somebody on the right for saying something edgy are going to be other right wingers. I mean, uh, Dinesh D'Souza, who people are familiar with, uh, canceled Sam Francis, um, back in the day because Sam Francis said some edgy stuff about race, which I think is entirely reasonable and very true. Um, you'll see like uh, daily wire people throwing their arms up in the air, uh, every second that Candace Owens brings up a, even a, a slight criticism of the certain group in the Middle East that we're not allowed to talk about, you know? Mm. So it's always the right that does this all the fucking time. And we need to stop doing this kind of stuff. I mean, like I can have personal beefs with people if they go after me and attack me, but as a, but much like to what you were just talking about, but that tweet right there. Yeah. There's nobody who's far enough right for me that I will not elect because uh, the world that they want to live in is infinitely better than, um, you know, any of the world that my enemies want to live in. So I, uh, you know, uh, and I think like uh, the, I guess like the, uh, the the test for it is like okay, if for some reason like the track cast like radically like took over the country tomorrow and made it into a track cast paradise, would I live under that? I'm like, yeah, I obviously would. I mean, if it suck, I mean, I would I would lose some of the things I really like to do. But at the end of the day, it's it's better than you know like uh, gay race communism uh, that we <laughs> basically have uh, these days, right? You know, so. <laughs> Yeah, I put out a tweet a while back, and I think I said uh, Christian nationalism seems kind of preferable to like the neo progressive, you know, uh, globo homo order that we have going on now. And you know, much to your point, I, I probably would be a little bit of an outcast because I love to play heavy metal music with you know people, and we like to get on, you know, wear all black and go up on stage. But I mean, at the end of the day, everybody in my band's kind of like a you know center well, okay. center right well, it's okay person. When you, it's okay when you do it because you're a friend. <laughs> <laughs> there, well, there you go. Yeah. And like, listen, if, if you met my bass player, you'd understand. I mean, he's multiple time business owner. Um, you know, he's a mechanic who raises dogs and owns a bar, blue collar dude to the core, Trump supporter. And once again, no qualms with any of that shit. He served in the military. I mean, this guy, once again, you leave him the fuck alone. He leaves you the fuck alone. But if, <laughs> if you want to fuck with him, it's on. And really, I think that's kind of where, you know, a lot of right wingers need to be is that, you know, hey, you know, as soon as you come within an inch of anything that I love or want to do, we're just going to beat you into oblivion and make sure you never come back asking for anything else. But, you know, if you're a friend, you're cool, but don't fucking cross that line. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what we're talking about here is just building social capital, building an aristocracy, yes. building mm -hmm. building a counter elite, uh, the next people to come in and take the reins of power. I mean, do you, it, I mean, we see this all the time because of how degenerate and horrible our elites are and stuff like this. But like, you know, mm -hmm. fucking all of them are on Epstein Island. They're all doing the most degenerate, like awful stuff in the world imaginable. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like, listen, anybody who comes in next uh, after them is bound to be more preferable to these like really like evil and satanic people. Oh, mm. so yeah, man, I, I completely agree. Um, yeah. So, okay. So, you know what, let's wrap on some of the dissident right stuff. So this has kind of been interesting to me, but, um, and I think you and I had a little bit of a back and forth and it's not like any rude way, but kind of just like a little bit of a conversation about it. Um, I don't know what to make of the dissident right because it seems like basically a lot of these people either were libertarians or kind of like grew up conservative and then became a little bit more aware of like the race and then the the tribe stuff so to speak and it, it seems like the purity spiraling happens in the same circles too like instead of it being yeah. oh well he's not a libertarian it's he's not white enough or he's a quarter jewish or he's married to a jeet he's not this he's not that it seems like the purity spiraling stuff i'm going to be honest on the dissident right seems just as gay if not gayer than libertarian so <laughs> i think i think what it is is not just a because when i get in person with um people that come yeah. to my conferences or people that are in like ogc chapters that i've been driving around the yeah. country meeting and such um like a lot of us have disagreements on 
you know, uh, I mean, some of us are pagans, some of us are more Christians, some of us are like ad- agnostic. I mean, like I'm a degenerate from the red pill sphere. There's a lot of people who are like, you know, very traditional <laughs> marriage kind of stuff like right. that. So we butt heads over a lot of things. Um, but uh, when we actually get in person, we just do not have this same degree of purity spiraling. And I think what this comes yeah. from is mostly from people being online where the, mm-hmm. the currency that people trade in is not necessarily uh, money, it's clout, you know, and the easiest way for you to get clout is to say something that's super bombastic. And it's yeah. also kind of an excuse for you not to do anything as well. It's like, oh, well, um, I'm going to just sit here and say it's black and we're all over and uh, everything is doomed and you guys going out and actually doing stuff, you're going to have egg on your face. It's kind of like an excuse that people can use to not do anything um, mm-hmm. as well. So uh, as it relates to the, you know, I have issues with this term and I know a lot of people uh, in my space have it as well, like the term dissonant right. I mean, it's it's kind of weird because it is like a very diverse group of people with radically different right. opinions and such. And there really is no central unifying force. It's not like we're like a political party or something. There's like, no like, sense. There's no like there's yeah. no leader to the movement here. That's another thing no. I noticed. And um, I, I just want to add this real quick to what you said is that another form of like social capital that people have when it comes to these movements is being the purest of the movement. Yeah. And and this isn't unique to the dissident right. I think this is no. kind of just the way that people are. Once again, I'm I'm the most pure libertarian. I'm the most pure dissident writer because I'm a you know six foot tall blonde blonde blue eyed you know white guy or right. something you like that. Like ever like the red yeah. pill sphere. We're like yeah, that, that fucking twat. Um. Uh, uh, that can of smashed assholes. Um, what's that guy's name? Uh, John Anthony. <laughs> yeah, I was John gonna say Anthony. the fat kid like, oh, from yeah, Brazil. Fuck, yeah, the fat kid from Brazil. I, I fucking bang two thousand <laughs> women. It's like, dude, shut the fuck up. Like yeah. nobody has done that ever. <laughs> you know, right. like, get out of here. You know, yeah, you see it in every space. You know, um, I think it's just a product of uh, people being online and such. Now, I guess uh, the best way I could describe what people would call like the distant right in general is i think the the root of it is just anti-egalitarian uh mm-hmm. i think it's just like the, the absolute root of it everybody in the movement no matter who you come across has just internalized the fact that there are differences between groups of people there's differences between races there's differences between men and women there's differences between you know uh, religions like we're, we're just we're not egalitarians okay and as such that uh changes the way people perceive the world as to uh politics as to economics as to a whole myriad of things and i think that's just the central lying uh thing and then also uh everyone in the movement if i can even call it a movement just understands that the the current status quo the current group of elites the current regime needs to be changed um you know you know everybody has their own different ideas of who they want to replace it with i mean you were mentioning christian nationalist people that's mm-hmm. one group obviously you have people who are like more wig gnats like oh we need to go into an ethno state you know so there there's people who are you know more on like a i don't know there's just, there's like a there's definitely like a techno i guess you would call it like techno globalist to some extent but also mixed mm-hmm. with you know, like uh, somebody like Eric Prince kind of comes to mind was like colonialism is back on the table, you know, and such, which is like, I mean, I'm kind of sympathetic to, you have people like who are vitalists and Nietzscheans, somebody like Bronze Age pervert, you know, so there's, there's a very large uh, diversity of opinions uh, throughout the space, but everybody is at the core of it, anti-egalitarian and wants the regime to change. Mm, gotcha. Yeah, I know there were um, there was some drama a couple months ago, and I think you largely stayed out of it. And you told me you would block some of the people that were getting involved in the drama. But like, I just kind of stood back and watched it, and I, I think I almost had the epiphany. I'm like, wow, is this how people feel about libertarians infighting? Because like, even I stand back <laughs> from that shit now, and I'm like, this is so gay. Like, literally nobody cares. Nobody cares about the dissident right infighting. Nobody cares about the libertarian infighting. Nobody cares about the red pill infighting. Like. People look at that and are like, wow, first of all, I want nothing to do with that. And you are all a bunch of fucking douchebags. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I, I think I did mention this when we were having drinks and such. It's like if you were making internet drama and internet beef with people, the entire purpose for your online presence, uh, that just shows me that you have nothing else going on. I mean, my mm-hmm. online presence is a front for my IRL work. My, I, my presence online, the entire purpose of it is to filter people into the things that I'm doing in the real world, whether it's mm-hmm. uh, organizing, whether it's, you know, fucking just hanging out and going for drinks and like hanging out for dinner or something like that, you know, yeah. or joining like OGC chapters or 
uh, sponsoring me and my partners and giving us money so we can do, uh, you know, some of our state admission points and such. I mean, that that is the goal of being online. I'm not I'm not here to, you know, uh, dunk on people and stuff like this. And in like the last like six weeks I've been traveling, I've fucking barely been on Twitter. You know, I sent out like maybe one or two tweets a day, you know, uh, obviously mm-hmm. aside from like Saturday when I was glued to my phone for like six hours. But, you know, it's just uh, the the real stuff is getting done in the real world. It's not being done online. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, where do I want to go with that right after that? Yeah, I, I completely agree because I, I love going out and this is kind of why, like over the last couple of weeks, um, you know, unfortunately the assassination attempt kind of drew me back in, but, um, you know, the band was going really good. We were playing lots of cool shows and like, I just noticed I did not give a fuck about politics. Like I tried to listen to a podcast. I, I want to say it was the morning that I was go or that we were opening for hinder and, uh, I just, I shut it off. I'm like, I can't do this right now. Like I, I kind of want to do it, but I just want to listen to music. I want to be happy. I want to just enjoy. I don't want to think about anything. I just want to be able to fucking do what the fuck I'm going to do. And I'm sure you were probably the same way leading up to like, you know, your conferences. It's like, oh, dude, I can't wait to just have a good time, be around other people. I'm a pretty extroverted person. So, I mean, I can talk, you know, anybody's ear off, but also just enjoy being around other people and spending time with other people. So, you know, doing like we did, having drinks and then seeing other people that I know or playing music. That to me is just the world to me. And, you know, people may look at my Twitter presence and think that I'm like some kind of bomb thrower like an asshole or something but i mean you know <laughs> i'm there to have a good time have some fucking drinks smile and laugh i mean that's just who i am i try to have you know an infectious positive energy but you know just people who want to sit there and beef with people on twitter all day it's like yeah you don't really have shit going on yeah exactly now uh if if like these weird uh and like parasocial like absurd fights uh that happen online between accounts that are like that one of the other things i have to remind people of all the time as well is under elon's twitter uh he's done a really good job of kind of gatekeeping people into their own sections of the internet which is kind of yes. why people aren't getting his banned as much so you aren't having like leftists come flying into people's mentions and just constantly like clicking with their like the report button on people um just go peek into like leftist like uh twitter sometimes and just see how much of a minority your account is you know like your account with like eight thousand followers is nothing compared to some of the biggest leftist accounts who literally have millions and get interactions on every single one of their tweets like we are just such a i mean our influence is very disproportionate to how large we are uh because like the ideas are here and this is where like actual discourse is taking place but uh, in the grand scheme of things, your like eight thousand person Twitter account beefing with a twelve thousand person account uh, is like just so negligible. Why are you even worrying about it? Right. Yeah, I, I completely agree. So, um, yeah, man. You know what? I think this is probably a good place to end it. Um, what's your hope for twenty twenty four and twenty two, or well, for the rest of twenty twenty four and twenty twenty five? Well, um, if I'm going to go with my uh, full-blown um, uh, hope, like uh, what I would ask the genie and everything like this, <laughs> um, the the biggest hope that I have is um, Donald Trump uh, gets into office and Vance um, courts him into more like dissident opinions. Um, what I would love to see from a second Trump administration is a total restructuring of immigration by all levels i think america's legal immigration basically needs to be capped to like 500 people a year um the illegal stuff we need to go back and change birthright citizenship we need to radically change um taxing uh income that's sent overseas uh back to people's families abroad we need to make english the official language of the united states um, we need to mass deport at least 60 to 80 million people, uh, by my estimations. Uh, these are people who have showed up here illegally in the last uh, 60 years and people that were wrongfully uh, given amnesty by um, you know, previous presidents. Um, you know, if, if it was done by a one stroke of the pen, it could be undone uh, by one stroke of the pen. Um, we need to avoid getting ourselves into foreign wars and foreign conflicts that do not directly benefit uh, the United States of America. Um, I would be open to having discussions about like, you know, future colonialism and such, but you know, that's already like way too much of a a list of things that will be changed. The biggest thing for me is immigration. It's, it's the issue that everything else uh, falls under. The reason why people can't afford homes, the reason why wages haven't been increasing, the reason why we have so much, um, um, 
breakdown of social cohesion and such is all the result of the fact that uh, America's literally just been treated as like an open air amusement park and economic zone for the last hundred years by our elites, by people who hate us. And uh, that just simply cannot be allowed to uh, continue. All right. Uh, American interests need to be put forth first. Heritage America needs to be put back um, uh, on the menu. Jobs need to return. Corporations that outsource uh, jobs who benefit from American legal code and legal protections and tax benefits, but send 75% of the workforce abroad to work for two cents a day is fr quite frankly, fucking bullshit and should not be allowed in any way, shape or form. Um, so that's just the biggest thing for me. America needs to be back for uh, Americans uh, at this point. Yeah. I think that's an America first vision I can get behind. You are that there? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll hawk, go ahead. Plug your shit, man. All right, cool. Um, you guys can follow me on um, uh, Twitter. Um, it's written right under my name here, uh, Red Pilled Hawk. Um, and then most of my work can be found at the old uh, Glory Club. We have um, fraternal chapters popping up all over the country. We have around uh, 15 of them are going to be up and running by the end of the year. So if you guys are looking for more uh, like-minded people of dissident opinions, uh, check us out on our website, um, oldgloryclub.com. And maybe you will have a uh, chapter that's in your locality and you know, uh, meet up with more uh, like-minded people. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. But uh, yeah. thanks for having me on, man. It's always fun talking to you. Yeah, of course. Well, uh, I can't wait to hang out with you again sometime, and I can't recommend checking out his stuff um, enough. Uh, by the time you hear this, unless you're a channel member, um, I'll be releasing this. Let me make sure I got this right. Uh, da, 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 the 21st. Um, so my band, Common Crown, feel free to check us out. Um, we will be opening for Flaw two dates um, in August, so make sure to go check us out, and we'll have some new music up, um, hopefully before the end of the year. But um, yeah, Hawk, I really, really appreciate you hanging out, man. And um, I'm looking forward to hanging out with you again and, uh, you know, hopefully getting to meet up some other uh, old Glory Club people, man. Right on, dude. Uh, thanks for having me on. Of course.